not least of which is really um, the some of the assumptions. I don't claim to be an expert in a lot of the issues, but just instinctively, intuitively feeling that a lot of the assumptions that were very, um, you know, easily made did not make me feel comfortable. For example, the assumption, the link between economic growth and um, foreign immigration, that we need all those numbers in order to grow. And then secondly, the link, the to what to me was the very tenuous link between um, oh, oh, we can have a slowdown in the economy if we have an aging population. Because from what I know, uh, coming from a layman's perspective, there are other views. And I'm surprised to see that these views were not reflected in something as important as the white paper. Thirdly, which I felt was really important, especially, especially hot on the heels of the political climate that we're dealing with at the moment, in the wake of the latest loss in the by election, in the wake of um, you know, raising awareness, consciousness, politically, socially, um, environmentally, among Singaporeans, young and old, is a haste in which we were expected to discuss, debate, and then vote on something to me that has far-reaching consequence to everyone. Not just you and I in this room, but even babies yet to be born, you know. So, so why is there not a lot more public engagement? Why is it not made the subject of um, the Singapore conversation, which was concurrently running anyway? So a lot of issues that were instinctive to me, which did not make me feel comfortable. And so I started preparing for it, but um, in the course of, of preparations, um, and you know, we have a schedule of speakers and, and there were Almost everybody in the house wanted to say something. All the opposition members, all the NMPs, not all the PAP members spoke, um, but everybody wanted to say something. So I had my paper ready, which I had to change every now and then. Every time somebody spoke, I had to change because I was really desperately wanting to listen up for anyone who, who wanted to say anything at all about environment, anything at all. It didn't happen. It was astonishing to me that nobody raised this. So, so. My turn was supposed to be on Tuesday, the second day of the debate. It didn't happen because, you know, people were speaking and then other people took over. Ministers wanted to also speak as well, so we had to kind of like run down the list. Um, so I had to kind of change my speech a few times until ultimately, after the second, at the end of the second day, it really, really bothered me. And so what came out was what you, you may have read, some of you, which were really principally three few things. So let me kind of... Um, um, shorten what I said by just noting what they are. Firstly, the haste of all in which this was to be debated and, and, and discussed and voted. And secondly, um, the fact that there was nothing, nothing in the white paper that talks about how all these numbers of people are going to impact on our carbon footprint, on our food security, which a lot of you already know we are 90% dependent on outside sources. So what does it do when we are even more heavily populated? Where's it all going to come from? Thirdly, what about waste management? What are we doing about that? Then, finally, really the more the green, what I call the green issues of which I'm most familiar because having been a member of the Nature Society for the last 30 years, this is something that I'm most comfortable with. Not hearing anybody speak about that. More importantly, the fact that if you look at the plans and the land use plan, because of the numbers that we're going to be introducing, we, the government plan to actually increase infrastructure, which will, according to the plan, affect the, uh, the central catchment nature reserve. To my horror, because as far as we know in the nature society and in the consciousness of most people in Singapore, when you call it a nature reserve, you believe it to be inviolable, which means it shouldn't be disturbed. And yet, to have a line that goes through it, without any other you know, uh, uh, signals to say what's going to happen to it was very worrying to me. And then the other issues, like the blue issues. You will know if you read the land use plan, there's going to be major reclamation works, especially all along the shores. What's the impact of all of that? Reclamation, as you probably realize, causes massive destruction. What's going to happen? What's going to be the consequence? And also, if you look at it, there is a high possibility that the places that you and I have known to love look over the years, like Chit Jawa for example, many of you here have been fighting for its survival from the time 10 years ago for it to be to stay where it is, will go, will be lost forever. 
And as you know, this is also in the central catchment area where lots of these disaffected forests in Singapore as well. So my question to them really is, we all know there's no EIA, Environment Impact Assessment. There are no compulsory laws at all. So if at all there is any kind of EIA, it would be within the agencies. How they do it, what they do with it, what the results are, no one knows. And um, we have an experience of actually asking in relation to Bukit Brown. Um, we don't receive a whole lot of information, which is, makes us really uncomfortable. Beyond that though, beyond the fact that we don't yet have an EIA law, which by the way, I was pushing for in my, in my speech, I wanted to know what was the thinking of the government agencies in even thinking, in even, that it even crossed their mind that it was okay to have a line that goes through the nature reserve. Have they done any sort of preliminary study? No matter how preliminary, I wanted to know. And what the what were the what were the answers to these preliminary questions if at all? And I wanted to get the public to be involved. I wanted it to be open to the public so that we, we there can be transparency. Those were the issues I wanted to know. And also to have an EIA to extend also to the coastal areas for the reclamation works and whether there was any that were done in the first. Then finally, really underlying all of it is way beyond conservation, way beyond even the issues. Really to me, the white paper, the land use plan, really reflects um, a philosophy that I think is not new to any of us. Those of us who have been living in Singapore, feeling as if we are economic digits, feeling as if you know um, GDP growth is all that we are measured by. And surely the time has come for a change in paradigm. I mean, everybody out there is feeling it. Why are they listening to us? Um, so the feeling that yet again, yet again, when this could have been, um, a, 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 you know, you could you could make a different, you could choose a different paradigm, you could choose a different path. This would have been your chance, especially in the wake of the political consciousness, the, the, the new awareness that's been rising in the society. That perhaps it's time for us to choose another paradigm that is non-linear, that doesn't always measure life in terms of numbers, that may well take a more holistic and humane approach. And I relate this to the um, our Singapore conversation for the green community that Eugene and I organized about a month ago, where to a man and woman in the room, there were about 80 of us, and that's quite a lot of people, all from the very spectrum of the environment movement to a man and woman said they want a society based on compassion, based on justice, based on something more valuable than just numbers. So can this not be reflected? So based on those reasons, I cannot in all a good conscience say yes. So I opposed. And it was interesting because um, I was actually the first NMP to say no. I think it was quite... Thank you. I couldn't have done it any other way because my conscience would let me. I mean, I think the opposition people, I think it's quite clear why they said what they said, but before that, it was uh, nobody else has said that. So after that, as you probably know, two other NMPs followed as well for other reasons beyond conservation environment, what I've just said. Uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. And if there's any questions or you know, whether you want to know how it felt like and what was the uh, response to what I said in the House within parliamentarians, perhaps we can use that as the subject of the Q&A later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kaiser. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Ho talk a little bit about the land use master plan and what it means from a conservation standpoint. Okay, uh, I have to stand there. Maybe the slide sequence. Hope you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm here speaking on my own, uh, my own capacity. But uh, the points I'm going to raise, I'm sure. Most of it. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, land use plan given to you and put in the newspaper. Uh, but uh, what shocked me is that uh, it is stated here there will be more greenery. This claim by the government that uh, whatever they are doing uh, with the 2030 plan, uh, they got sort of uh, some kind of uh, what they call environmental sustainability. There are a lot of green areas 
and uh, you know, we can set that as far uh, nature reserve will be observed. Alright? So, uh, have a look at this. Uh, some of the points uh, that I want to draw up, uh, you can draw up uh, points up, the points are the points It will go all the way to the UK, the Kong, and then swing back to the main island. Alright? That means, uh, for one, you mean it will be better for housing. Yeah. Right in the, in the park picture. After the meeting, just in the chain down on the plane, things like that. Uh, Alright, to have a good idea of the kind of uh, destruction of the existing greenery in Singapore, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Alright, so this is a slide taken from the article by Mr. Yi et al. For the gardens bulletin. Alright, this give you a picture. Uh, this is uh, around 2 Alright, so this will give, a, give you the idea, an idea of the existing greenery dam all over Singapore. Right. And uh, next please. So we can compare the two. Okay, so uh, I mean some of the areas of concern for us conservation aids, especially nature society will be places like Ubin, uh, Mandai, there's a mangrove patch here, Mandai mangrove, uh, it's going to be reclaimed, the whole shoreline here, the Mandai shore will be reclaimed, and the Mandai mangrove will be right now, right, and uh, of course there is also an important missing site of the bay-headed fishing hill there, right, and then of course some of the islands like uh, St. John will be uh, in the plan, future reclamation, yeah. Okay, and uh, things like Pasiris coastline too will be reclaimed. So the green belt there will be also uh, utilized for residences and, uh, and so on. <coughs> now, uh, my position basically is that uh, even the views expressed by various expert professionals in the media and so on, uh, Mr. Lisa Lim and, uh, you know, and you know, some experts from uh, Austria, things like that. Uh, there is definitely an alternative to our future without, without following the, the plan laid out by the government to have about 6.9 million. We don't need to go to that point, right? We can even stay put, right, up to or have the population remain at the same level or increase slightly uh, without disrupting the economy, without slowing down the economy badly. And of course, uh, you have the view of taking soon. We even claim that if we want 7 million, we can house at 7 million. We use sort of a intensify the development along the southern coastline. Uh, use up some of the golf houses, we clean land, and uh, move the port to the Tuas, and so on. You can house 7 million without touching any of the remaining greenery on the island. Right? That is possible. But personally, of course, I want to see 7 million in Singapore. Really, 5.4 million is enough. Of course. Okay. So, uh, all right, you can see here, in Hong the mangrove here too, allow you pay. If they reclaim it, for residential housing, for housing, it will be wiped out. Right. The poor will be left in time, although there are reclamation going on. And uh, of course, there will be some reclamation here too, but that is not so bad. All right. But in the places in Pasir Bays, uh, Pasir Bays, yeah, uh, and Mandai, and then uh, in the Southern Island, St. John, uh, sorry, uh, in the Flora Yes, how do we add? Right? <coughs> Next. Okay. Now, the government plan that the kind of housing we're going to come up will be environmentally friendly, very green. But if you look at this uh, master plan for Congo, right, it looks like a great jungle. Right? It's a hard try from, uh, you know, the kind of green township we want to develop. Right. Uh, okay, next look at the comparison with some Google map. 
go for Congo for example. There's a lot of greenery along the coast here. It's Congo Marina. There's a stretch of uh, Kaswarina forest all along here. All right, all the way to the to the jetty. All right, the jetty. Okay, and then to the east of the jetty, another stretch of forest. All right, and then the forest is now clear. And then at this corner, at the estuary of Serangoon River, there is another patch of Pizwarida Forest. In somewhere along here where the light MRT line, which is not in use yet, uh, runs, okay, you know, there is another patch of forest, quite thick. So, you see the development coming up. Right. Right. Coastal Pizwarida Forest is wiped out here. And then a mixed coastal forest here, will be wiped out and then further down here too will be thin and here too the corner here also will be wiped out. As for Odi Island, right, there's a track running through, cutting it into half. Uh, the southern half will be developed for housing in the future plan. And what will be left as a path will be just the northern half. So the whole plan doesn't reflect Right, this trust towards you know the maintaining the greenery towards what we call sustainable development of the life. Right. You sort of a benchmark it against preserving natural processes, natural ecosystems and so on. Next All right, so uh, they have uh, set up some new area, nature areas. Green plan and uh, one of these is Jalan Kamala, which is at the Kanka Arm of the Crunchy Reservoir. Right? Hilly, dusty, marshes, woodland. There are rare plants here. Right? And also a place for the gathering of fireflies. Uh, I don't know what is the extent of that nature area. Uh, it is actually along in the in Crunchy Reservoir. Right? Then we uh, have Lapu Mo, another new nature area, which is an extension of the Tokong Mangrove nature area. Uh, it is north of Pulau Tokong. Right? It's a very small island, all right? uh, important for two locally endangered mangrove species, uh, maybe uh, what they call uh, Sandy Coast Mangrove. Uh, then you have Mating Prono, which is again off the northern coast of Tokong. Uh, intertidal habitat and they have very rare, three very rare for last species, as well as ten rare for last species, as well as things like lovely sea far, thorny sea urchin. Alright? So, uh, these are in addition to what we have now in the Green Valley, which is, uh, there are four nature reserves, Bukit Timah, Central Catchment, Labrador, Sinai Bulo, and then 18 nature areas. Example of uh, things like Rapo, Kranji uh, Marshes Park, Pulau Hibri. Right. So, I mean, uh, in my opinion, of course, uh, I have nothing against uh, these new areas included into the green plan. Uh, they are important too. You know, uh, but uh, they can, in no way, be some kind of a substitute or compensation for what the Destroyed uh, in the uh, use plan. All right. So uh, this is a uh, background info. Now you'll be surprised. We have a lot of green areas. Right. There's a lot of room for nature conservation. A lot of important areas too, which are not protected hmm. outside the green plan. So there was a study done by. Mr. E. et al. published in the Gardens and Blue State of Vegetation of Singapore. Now, from the satellite study, right, from the satellite study, the total green area of Singapore comes to 56%, which is more than half of Singapore. So, Singapore is not a concrete jungle. Uh, the idea that it's a concrete jungle is, you know, uh, something that uh, really is, uh, those who does not move around Singapore that much. Uh, walk up to this, Alright, out of 
the sand of the total land area. Green seven is managed green area, like park, golf courses, lawns, all that. And then we have 29 percent that is spontaneous, unmanaged wild green area. 29 percent, almost 50 percent, right? So breakdown for the spontaneous area is 29 percent. Forest, inclusive of mangrove, swamp forest, 32 to 5 percent. In scrubland, 6 percent. That's water washing, 1 percent. That's a lot. 0.1 percent. And of uh, course, person thing. I think that we should observe all of this. If not all of it, at least this is 29 percent of spontaneous wild greenery. All right. Uh, the green plant. What we have in the green plant? Protected green areas. Total green set aside is 10, only 10 percent. All right. For parks, 0.5 to 5 percent. Nature reserve, 4.5 percent. So it comes to about 10 percent. So every part corner of Singapore will, will, will be developed except this 10 percent. Right. Unprotected spontaneous green area lab. Uh, if you uh, if the forest is five. Right. Uh, if you minus, uh, if you like to the minus 4.5 nature reserve, you have 24.5 percent left. Minus the nature reserve. Okay. So for forest, it comes to 18.5. Scrapland 6 percent. All right. You can use up the scrapland. Not very good. Not very rich in biodiversity. But this 18.5 or 19 percent of forest, some of it. Second, secondary, all secondary forests, some are young, some are very old. All of these are at least worth preserving. So 20% plus another 4.5 of nature. So it's a little bit of At least we want to preserve all the videos. We want to take soon once. You know, plus personally, I think we should preserve all the greenery that remains. So, right? It is. Or at least 50 Right, so the figures given here are very hard to see. Right, uh, because it's only uh, the, the current state is that it's smaller because of recent massive development, for example, the issue. Next. Alright, uh, just an uh, example of a secondary forest. This copy is Algesia tree. Next. Okay, these are the, the thing about this secondary forest unprotected. It's that they are becoming a home ground for a lot of for our what we call resident raptors, bird of prey. Uh, one of this is the changeable hawk zoom, uh, which is in the red data book in nature. Right. Home ground is they, they would nest in those areas, secondary forest, especially Easier trees. They prefer the easier trees. Of course, what's going on is that our nature reserve, whole secondary forest, uh, the carrying capacity for a lot of these birds, forest birds, has been exhausted. Carrying capacity is exhausted. So, for example, the hawk will move out of the forest to these secondary patches that are in suburbia in the countryside to nest, to breed. Next example, tangible hawk eagle breeding uh, on the Alvesia tree. Next, this is an endangered species, very great headed fish eagle. Also, like to nest in this secondary forest, especially on Alvesia tree. Right, endangered species. Next example, on the Alvesia tree, the great headed fish eagle. Alright, uh, because of the rapid development, massive development. These endangered hawks are all in trouble. Right? A lot of nesting sites have been demolished. Right? Uh, Passing days, we have tangible hawk in the nest, the white hawk, the Isun, and the Cape Brown, and a whole host of other areas are all in trouble. We have uh, at the end of the railway line down at the Mandai Mangrove. Near the castle immigration point, it's a mess there. But they're going to develop uh, uh, some kind of institution over there in the 30 plan. 
Next. All right. This is the uh, nest of the white belly sea eagle. You get up, get up, put a prey. You prefer to nest in this one easier. Next. All right. Couple for the nest side. Next. Young. Make sure that white belly sea eagle. Next. It's a white belly sea eagle nest. Passer race. That's the end. So a lot of this thing is happening all over Singapore. Dairy farm, uh, even uh, at Rentor, where the you know, high tech park there, Rentor, uh, at Woodland. My goodness, all I like from White Belly Sea Eagle and the Changeable Fog Eagle. The grey headed is much more uh, scarce. All right. So far, uh, none of these are trouble except Next, all right, example of a group and so on. Only 1% left is the four. And uh, with all those permission they have come, more will be wiped out. 1% out of 13%, when Stanford Brothers landed, there were 13% of this mangrove around the island, along rivers and so on. Next, Scotland. Now, this, of course, you can use the development. Of course, the entire is not so good. Right? There are 6% of these for Singapore. So you can use up these 6%. Right? Yeah. Next, Parkland. Very clean, very neat. Example of a Parkland habitat in a public park. So, uh, I mean, it's not very rich in biodiversity. So, a wild woodland where you have a lot of other growth. Next, uh, give you a grassland, grassland, now my bro, my bro, expensive grassland. Of course, all the grassland in Singapore are not going to be permanent, so they are only one stage, early stage in the succession, vegetational succession to scrapland and then finally to the So even if you have grassland, it's worth preserving, so that you know you will develop into a good thing. Next, freshwater marshland. Uh, you were surprised. It's a very extensive uh, area. This is just opposite the Marina South, new the new key at Marina South. Just opposite. Extensive place. Uh, a lot of butterflies, dragonflies, and marshland wildlife. Here. But uh, because they created that islands by clay and a new highway, they could run along the coast of Marina South. All the way to Marina East. Yeah, fill up all the time. Next. All right. Well, in the background, uh, there was a survey done on people's uh, attitude towards greenery uh, in 2001, done by Singapore Environment Council. Uh, well, the question is how can you conserve nature reserve and park? 85% say yes. All right. Should more land be allocated for nature, 52% maintain that, say that we should maintain the current number. Now, 40% say well, we should go for an increase in nature areas, nature park, nature reserve. 3% say no, I mean we should have less of nature areas. Now, uh, this I think is very significant because 40% is a significant percentage that is too old. And uh, I learned that uh, uh, a lot among these are young people, right? So now, 10 years later, there's a lot of change. I believe that more young people will be very supportive, right? And uh, I think it's time that uh, someone, some of them, do another survey to gauge the preference of uh, people now. It's very right? So, I think that we should, you know, use basically because uh, my, my thinking is uh, ecocentric. Right. I think that our economy is embedded. Our economy is embedded, right, in the natural environment, right. So, whatever you do with in our economy, we should sort of uh, use. 
what I call ecosystem as a kind of measure as to how far we can proceed with expanding our population our economy. So if we proceed to such an extent that a lot of our ecosystem and all that will be in trouble, then I think we should sort of think more carefully and uh, come around to an assessment of how far we can proceed, you know, so that whatever we have can be sustained. Of course, we can consider everything and depend on what happens outside Singapore. Right? We are just basically enlarging our footprint and use other people productive land right, for our information. But we should not proceed in that way. This new era of global warming and so on. So there are a lot of uh, factors we, do, we should think about right? uh, for the importance of this, uh, of preserving the greenery. Apart from the biodiversity, you have to think of you know, uh, ecosystem services that we really provide. Uh, control of flooding, right? uh, amelioration of uh, warming, local warming, ambient temperature, and uh, things like that. So uh, I believe that we can do more for conservation, part of just preserving the 10% that are already designated as part in uh, nature reserve. Thank you. Uh, green paper. Hi everyone, I'm Sin Yuan and I'm representing Koyu. We are a group of six students. Two, uh, three of us just graduated from junior college. One still in it and two are secondary four. Okay, um, I think I would like to start this by kind of explaining why I'm here, how I came to be here, and what I'm talking about. Because it might be quite puzzling to you, and I think with rare exceptions, I might be one of the youngest here. And that kind of scares me, to be honest. Okay, basically, when I was asked if I could talk tonight, I was actually really scared because, like, it says there that I'm representing you. But obviously there are far more youth than six of us for me. And I cannot speak for everyone. Uh. So I just I would just like to say what I understand the youth around me to think about the white paper and about the environment. Okay, firstly the white paper. Um as you would know, a lot a lot of people are unhappy with it. The youth are no exception. Except there's so much angst about the number 6.9 million and nobody to articulate the angst for us to I have not met a single person who actually wants to have 6.9 million people in the system. I will be 36 years old in the system. I will not even be middle aged yet by demographic measures. And if I have a kid, and if I get married like the government hopes I will, <laughs> then my kid will probably be like 6, 7 years old. That's a long time. No, that's not to say that that's a long time from now, but that's a long time for me to live with the impact of the population of white people. And I think that's why we are all quite concerned. We want to live in a world that, well, to sound tautological that we want to live in, and not a world that the government wants us to live in. Arguably, the government should help us create a world that we want to live in. What does that world include? The world includes a lot of things, but one major thing is like what the whole just shared, more nature. Because, okay, this is kind of like a slight digression, but I hope you see what I get, I'm getting at. Um, I grew up not really realizing that Singapore uh, is very created, like in the sense that our landscape is very planted and everything is very deliberately planned for. But I grew up recently to my father talk about his childhood in Kranji area, when he grew up in a farm, when he went fishing in the mangrove, when he like could identify trees by name and pick off the fruits and eat them and not get food poisoning. <laughs> and I couldn't do that. I tried not to eat the fruits now, but to like look around me. I didn't know what was around me. Until Dr. Hope presented all that just now, I never knew that there were so many things in Singapore. Like so many like features of nature. And it's not that I wasn't listening in job class. I hope I was. <laughs> but it just never connected. A lot of us didn't like geography because it was just very technical about 
how like cracks form in limestone and how mountains collapse and not what kind of, what kind of landscape is around us and where we are. So yeah, like we hear about all the talk about we want a Singaporean Singapore, we want a Singaporean core, and we think that by understanding nature and by respecting it, by having more of it around us, we will create a sense of space, of Singaporean space. In the same way that when you say Middle East, you think desert, uh, desert, and you, when you say like Borneo, you think Great Forest. If a Singaporean thinks Singapore and thinks of the Malayan and the Singaporean flyer, it's not very Singapore, is it? I mean, okay, yes, it's Singapore, but that's like one tiny portion of Singapore. That's not. 6% of Singapore. Okay, um, to get back to the topic of the white people, we feel that um, we, we don't really understand why the MRT line has cut through the central catchment area. We talked about it for a while. We decided that it was probably because they didn't really see any difference in the green areas. Apparently, that is uh, quite true. Yeah, like when I was learning, like when I was on the job shadowing program and went to URA, I asked them, uh, what counts as a green area? And they said, the planter box in the new condos we are building. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is quite green, la, but, <laughs> but you know, like, the difference between green areas can be seen by the most common sense of Singaporeans, but apparently not by the URA. <laughs> as in, I think it's very good to have a lot of green areas, but at least categorize them or something. Yeah, that's one thing that everyone in my school at the job training program thought. Because we were very puzzled, like, apparently the new rule is that every building, every new building must replace what it takes up, land space, green area, and this is one way they can fulfill the requirement. So, yeah. Uh, okay, what we youth want is not very different from what most Singaporeans want. We want to be represented in what goes on in 2030. We want to see a paradigm shift. Yeah, and in that sense, why, why a lot of people like accuse us of being apathetic and why we quite object to that label is because we haven't found a place that we can feel like we are respected for our views and not trying to force fed somebody else's. Like, is it, it's not just about the supposed uh, very narrow mainstream media, supposed, I don't actually think it's very narrow, but well, people think, some people think it is. It's also that other platforms, like um, the blogosphere and um, some online newspapers, are not given as, many, as much credibility as the mainstream media. Some platforms are politicized, which not all of us do. And finally, people just don't seem to take you very seriously. Well, I mean, that's quite. I see. I can't really like object to that. Some some yes, are not very like sensible, but then not every adult is very sensible either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like at least give us a fair chance. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely true. <laughs> okay. Um. So like just to, just to illustrate this point, all six of us in this whole youth um are not in any political party. And we do not wish to be. Yeah, as in we, although we are sex people, we actually represent like all. The, we hope to represent at least all the other youths that we know, like our friends, our CCAs, our our um, extended family, our cousins. And while we can't possibly encompass all the opinions in one paper, we hope to try, and we hope that you can support us, if possible. What we hope to cover would include, um, as illustrated just now, green, brown, blue and education issues. Education because it undergirds all the rest. Green, brown and blue issues because if you are not a fanatic who tries really hard to find out about all this on the internet, like, you are probably not very aware of this stuff in Singapore. Um, finally, like, I would just like to wonder, and I don't know if you have wondered about this, but I noticed that like Singapore is very proud of its standing in the world for a lot of things like um, a wonderful airport, wonderful infrastructure and Singapore is ready to learn from many other countries about all these things but we don't seem to be very ready to learn about how to preserve our environment which we have so much of and we have so much biodiversity in ours often much more so than the countries that are very good at protecting their own environments and that seems a little, little silly because it's like we are looking overseas but we don't treasure what we have and if 
we have to have a sustainable economy. The economy is part of an ecology, and ecology is not just about the, the non-human things. I think people like to separate themselves from the ecology very often and forget that like we are kind of similar to apes and bacteria and worms. So when we see that as a whole big picture, I just hope and we just hope that Singapore can move in a more holistic direction. Be a little humbler about what to do with our environment. And if we don't know, then do what we are already doing for our other aspects of our country. Learn from the best at it. So yeah. Uh, we don't we haven't actually decided when we want to release the, our paper because we want to know like what people think is a good time. I mean we are looking at like within this half of the year. Yeah. Thank you very much, Xinyuan. Um, now it's time for some questions and answers. Any questions? I can start. Chris in the back there has a question. Yeah, uh, my name's Chris. I'm from Ground Up Initiative. Uh, Pfizer, I, um, I, I, I agree with you that there does seem to be a, a disconnect and some underlying unchecked assumptions. Um, and not just in this paper, you know, throughout the idea that um, growth is today, as, as you said, uh, the economy exists within the environment and depends on those resources and its stability for, uh, for the environment to grow. And so, yes, uh, sorry, for the GDP to grow. So, yes, GDP and adding population is a great way to grow GDP, but it's also a great way to grow our footprints. And those two things are going to come into conflict and crash quite violently very soon. And the environment has the forces of the universe and mankind has the laws of mankind. So it's going to be a bit one-sided. I was my question to you and actually to everyone is what do you feel your own role or even our role is in helping people to understand that reality? Thanks, Chris. I think it's a question that everyone here should also answer. Here's my perspective. In fact, um, when all is said and done, when all the angst and emotions, uh, well, you know, we never really get this over this emotional hump, much as some straight time journalists want us to do. Because I think it is a very emotional issue, and it should be, and it should be roundly discussed, debated, and and, and talked about. He seen here the thing. Um, maybe you could just share what happened after um, the speech that I made got passed, got shared on Facebook. And I think it may indirectly respond to your question as well, Chris. Because interestingly, I mean, what I said was really my perspective and of course the perspective of many in the green community and many people I know who may not necessarily be greedies but who feel this way about Singapore, not necessarily conservation, but this way about we are economic digits and all. Interestingly, a lot of them, people I don't even know, responded to the speech and said that, um, you know, I feel this same way, but I don't seem to have the platform to say something. I, I, I'm not encouraged to express how I feel. And I'm not sure whether they mean within their family, within their community, within their workspace, within the political sphere. And while it is very humbling to receive this very positive feedback to what was really my take, I felt really sad because what kind of society have we become that we cannot even address issues that may not necessarily be concurrent with what is the established um, um, view or the accepted view that we can express ourselves freely without being judged or being made wrong. So in answer to that question, I take it down to the micro level, meaning to say, I take it down to my own personal family. How do I engage my kids? And I'm not saying this to be a template for anybody else. I'm saying this is, when we talk about this thing called a Singaporean core, that we're so afraid that we'll be um, tarnished or will be affected by the onslaught of many other people, perhaps we need to step back from from all these arguments that we rightly have, we rightly should say, yes, we should put the government to task for the things that they didn't do or the things that they did do, which we don't think they should. At the same time, I think to also step back and reflect on 
what do we do in our own lives? I mean, how do we engage people who may not necessarily agree with us within our own community, our own families? How do we allow them to express themselves? Because I fear, and I think as, as uh, Sinwen has already pointed out, and she's a huge, I think her group is a manifestation, and it's a scary manifestation of the society that we are becoming, of people who are not able or allowed to express their views and we call ourselves a first world country. So to get back to the question, what do I do as an, as an individual? Firstly, within my family, I make sure that views are heard, no matter what they are. Secondly, and this is one of the things that we raised in the Our Singapore conversation, as an NMP in the parliament where most people have no understanding, um, it's not really that they don't care, I think, I think they do, but they're not, it's not in that consciousness every day. When you represent a constituency that cares a whole lot more about leaf upgrading and transport, and rightly so, I'm not saying that's wrong, because these are day-to-day -day stuff that should be addressed and delivered. It's not in your consciousness to think about where your food comes from, say, or what's my covered footprint. How do I mainstream this conversation? Even in Parliament, I find it a challenge to actually raise this in the context of, say, bills that are going to be passed, or even, you know, anything that gets asked. How do I include this thing? So, here's what I do. In my speech, and also in my maiden speech last year when I was a newly minted an MP, put this in the context of health. So you actually address these so-called environmental concerns, which people still think we are a niche community. People still think it's an interest group. So put them in the context of other wider um, political concerns or social concerns like health, for example. So one of the things I raised twice, um, in fact, some of the questions too in, in, in my PQs, is to put this in the context of my students, for example, anecdotal evidence <coughs> where my students um, I teach in a, in a polytechnic, who will get taken out to, to nature areas and they have a sense of well-being, they feel at peace, they also have a sense of awe. Imagine 20 year old kids, well not kids anymore, young adults, feeling a sense of awe, being connected beyond the iPods and the iPads, being connected to what's in the forest and feeling this sort of emotions and then coming to the conclusion, wow, Singapore got nature, not bad. Huh? You know, I mean, to me, that, that becomes real to them, to giving them this kind of experiences and showing to Parliament, whoever wishes to listen, that these are actually related to health. You know, how these people feel a sense of well-being. Imagine, here we are talking about productivity, right? How to raise productivity. Well, that keep your nature places because scientifically it's been proven in many years a scientific paper is no longer anecdotal. Many books have been written. We should just be concentrating on them to show the direct link between nature spaces and our physical, emotional and mental well-being. Even, even if all you do is stare out of their window, even if um, you, you may not want to be a doctor who, you may not want to know the names of birds and plants, you may not be inclined to know, but if all you do is stare out of the window to stare at the greenery, it makes you well already. And here we are talking about the burden we are going to be costing the government on health care when it's already out there. Nature as an eco service provider. So the, the challenge I think for you and I, not just me in Parliament, because my term is only another year or so, it's not a whole lot, is to mainstream this kind of conversations in, in whoever our community is. And if it goes up to the high authorities even better. So I think I think you know that's that's how I would go about it. And maybe in that way strengthen this thing we call the Singapore core. What is it really? Yeah. Thank you. about you, Dr. Ho? How do you get the people who care about lift upgrading and sheltered walkways to perhaps also care about these forest areas that are near them in Pongol, in Tanamara, and so on? How to get them appreciative of the wilder part of Singapore, apart from the uh, parks, uh, art connectors, and so on. Well, I mean, the only way is to bring people to the areas, you know, to conduct trips and uh, show them things, you know, open up their eyes, their ears, to the beautiful, interesting, curious things around. So nothing like having uh, direct contact with nature. I, I feel that um, in, in the schools and uh, in the educational field, all education, uh, the tendency is to push the theoretical aspect of nature, of uh, ecology, 
students are taught all the scientific aspect of ecology, ecosystem, and so on. And uh, throughout the years, there is a kind of push for ecological studies, projects, and so on. And, and students have been coming to me or to the members of the society to get help and all that. And they want to do a very ambitious project to study ecosystem or ecological relationship between uh, various aspects of the site and all that. So uh, a lot of them came to me, they, I, they, I mean, for the impact of global warming on the uh, nature in Singapore. And then I just asked them, have you been moving around to look at what is there in Singapore? Sometimes they mention some of the interesting uh, nature areas, like crunchy marshes, Mandai mangrove. Say, so have you visited those areas? Do you know what are there? What are interesting species of plant, birds, you know, whatever is there? No clue at all. They have not stepped anywhere. They don't, and yet they want to do some sophisticated ecological studies. I think this should not be the approach at all, even in the schools. Maybe up to uh, the A level. I mean, uh, A level and above, fine. You, know, you want to go into theoretical ecology, fine. Sophisticated stuff. But at a secondary, primary school, secondary level, the first thing is that you've got to go to the field, get to know your nature. And one of the ways is to look and maybe to spot the species of birds that are found in the woodland. What are the migratory birds? What are the resident birds? Things like that. Slowly you build up your intimacy with wildlife. So. And then later on you can conduct a higher level, sophisticated ecological study. I'm shocked. Find students coming here right? and they expect you to sort of uh, give them the data. In the, you know, the Nature Society has collected a lot of data through surveys and all that. And they expect you to just give it to them, a whole lot of data, and then they will go back to their classroom and work it out without bothering to go to the ground to look and to see for themselves. That is a big problem. It's, it's, it's still exam driven. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, what I say might sound really underwhelming. Basically, I recently started walking. That might sound rather strange. But one of the happiest moments I had in the past few months was when, I, when having forgotten to bring my wallet, I walked from Clark to Commonwealth. Yeah. It took, um, I can't remember how long, because my phone ran out of bed. So I had no like, clock. But, like, because I was walking, I could see um, trees, random animals, birds, stuff, and random, random, just random creatures. Uh. And um, I actually think that because we are very used to and we want very good transport, which is not a bad thing, I don't like crowded trains either. Like, it's, but we have forgotten how to walk, and that's rather sad. Because when you walk, you feel like you are somewhere. Like, this is also somewhat connected to last year when. I went to Germany on exchange and my friend's, my exchange partner's father is really into like gardening. Then he brought me on a tour of his garden and he t told me about all his plants. Then he said, okay, actually this plant is also found like, um, like 5 km away along the coast, or along the like, bank of the river which goes past our house. And that river actually goes to like places X, Y, Z. Then, like, then he brought me out to the river and walked me along the whole river. Then showed me like basically all the wildlife around the river. Which there was quite very little of actually because it was in the middle of winter. And when you remember that this exchange partner's father is actually a DHL delivery man, and that my father, who I mentioned just now, is a teacher and not anything to do, and he's not actually very interested in environmental issues, you can see that like some people of a certain age and a certain generation actually know what's around them, and I think that's because they actually feel it. And I think to start with, just don't take the bus for one day, or don't take the car for one day, and just walk. Like, I mean, you don't have to walk very far, like, like you can just walk like the supermarket or something, instead of taking the bus there. Then I think that will help. Yeah, I'd just like to add further to what I've said. Uh, the situation in Singapore is pretty different. This is like US and <coughs> UK. <coughs> uh, sad to say, of course, uh, maybe we are, we are a new nation, 
And uh, there's a lack of a kind of a, of a natural history tradition in Singapore, as you can see in the UK or the USA. By natural history, I mean a, a tradition of a, what they call a, of a acquaintance, knowledge of nature that is not based on a scientific study, I'm scientific sure methodology, or attitude. Uh, this has to do with uh, what Kaiser will talk about, having a holistic approach. Uh, this natural so history tradition started off with people in the UK from Gilbert One, right, who walk around his uh, parish, his curator, curator, uh, priest, and uh, observe what happened in his neighborhood and then jot down in a letter form, send it to his friend to express what he see, his joy, and so on. Uh, then, of course, it's a long tradition, several centuries, from Gilbert White, which is the most uh, printed book, uh, I think in the UK, almost every year there's a tradition. Natural History of Selvan, Gilbert White, start out with. It comes out to people like uh, uh, Richard Jefferies, William Henry Hudson, right? Adrian Bell, and of course the poet William Wordsworth, you know, John Clare. This is what I call a natural history tradition, which is not scientific oriented. You know, people express their response to nature, how they feel about nature, the beauty that they see, and uh, this is much more accessible to the layman, to people in general. So we just focus on scientific study, uh, scientific uh, you know, data, and so, so on. Same thing with the U.S. You have a tradition uh, that comes from, uh, let's say, John Barrer, uh, Harry David Turo. These are somewhat philosophical, but again, they, they, they reflect a kind of holistic approach to nature. I'm sure uh, this is somewhat like things. We tend to, when people are you know, uh, interested in nature, we tend to see that they take, tend to take a scientific approach, uh, which comes from their schooling, you know, the things that they have in school. Or they tend to be like, if they are not uh, scientists, or people they tend to go for, you know, tend to be competitive, go for a list. You know, the the more the greater the list of rarities you have, the more you feel you know, great. This kind of thing, you see. they call them twitches. People uh, yes. collect lists of rarities, lists of uh, birds, lists of this and that. But there is no something that is different, something non scientific, something that is much more uh, poetic. If you like, I call this the natural history. And you can see this a lot. Old tradition. But uh, I mean, if you look at Ellen Abbey, for example, Desert Solitaire, this kind of writing is absent. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hao first, and then the gentleman in the t-shirt behind you. Can you uh, please speak up? Sure. Uh, Thank you. Right, Yiting, my name is Han Chong. I'm from the Nature Society, and I'd like to just propose some answers to what Sin Yen has uh, queried earlier. Number one, um, Singapore has always been concerned about our water security and that's the main reason why we have the central catchment forest and uh, some sources tell us that now it seems that PUB is very assured that we will have water by every means desalination, reverse osmosis 90% of the rainfall will be captured by reservoirs but there was an ecological impact we have dammed up all the major rivers in Singapore, <coughs> right? And I think one of the main reasons why they think that they can build this MRT line is because we no longer need the central catchment reserve as the water catchment, right? They do not think that this is a suitable area, or they actually basically think that they do not, we do not need it as a nature reserve, right? That's number one. Number two, there are two other security issues for Singapore which uh, Faisal has alluded to. The day Thailand has so many people that they cannot afford to feed themselves, I'm not sure where we'll be getting our rice. Right? The day in which fossil fuels run out, I think we'll be back to the Stone Age. So I think these are the two issues all Singaporeans must be aware of. Next, I was also some a person like Sing Yen. I was never from the Kampong. I was Sorry. a HDB boy. But thankfully, I've learned a bit more about nature in Singapore after 20 years associating with the Nature Society. And I learned that in Singapore, we do have animals that 
are only found in Singapore, not even found in Johor and Batam. Truly, uniquely Singapore, which is what STB has been trying to tell the world, that we are uniquely Singapore. Not in a way that we create a Malayan logo, not in a way that we're going to tell ourselves that we have organized the first F1 night race, but we truly have these animals in Singapore. Where are they? They are in our freshwater swamp forest. And our challenge, any Singaporean or any Singapore group of Singaporeans, to tell me what these animals are. And I can again say that probably only 1% of Singaporeans, or probably less, will know what these animals are. Okay, let's have a quick poll. Any one of you know what these animals are? <laughs> okay, very good. Freshwater crabs. All right, three species. Take a look. There's other things. All right, this is part of our ecological heritage. So yes, I do agree with Dr. Ho. We may not have a tradition, but we have a great heritage. All right. The co-founder of the theory of the origin of species, um, what? Alfred Russell Wallace. Yes, was Alfred Russell, Russell Wallace. He came to Singapore, and in three weeks, he collected 700 different species of beetles. Just one type, longhorn beetles. We have more tree species than the whole of the United Kingdom. That's not quoted by me, huh? it's by a British naturalist. We have more coral species than all of Hawaii or the Caribbean. We can see the wild dolphins in the wild. No need to see them in the aquarium. In fact, if you go behind the two aquariums, you can see the coral reef. Yeah. All right. <laughs> But we prefer to put them in a very large tank and tell the world we have the largest aquarium. Okay, next. In terms of ecocentric planning, I still think that yes, we need to let everyone know that we need to find out how are we truly sustainable and not focus on sustained development. It seems that these two things are being mixed up. What is truly, what is sustained development? or the new phrase I think by the government now is quality growth. I'm still very unsure what this actually means, quality growth. But what I think we should move towards is actually sustainable development. How much greenery do we want in Singapore? I'd like to think that we are truly a little green dot. 56% green. Let's keep it that way. Thank you. The gentleman is a t-shirt. Um, so my name is Brandon. I'm, I'm an undergrad from SMU. I just came back from India and Kazakhstan. So Sorry, could you speak up, please? Okay, I just came back from India and Kazakhstan, and you might be wondering, you know, um, why did I go start? Because and that's something that I realized uh, that these Singaporeans need. I think maybe you have your view on it. Um, slowing down uh, for a moment. Uh, what I realized is that um, when I was in all this country, uh, there's the old city and the new city. Uh, in Singapore, we kind of go new all the time. We don't go old, um, and it kind of and the new kind of grows old eventually. So uh, I think for a moment we just slow down our development, and then uh, maybe I have some ideas on how to slow down. Um, one of the things I saw the government did was actually the number of cars in Singapore, which is increase of 60 percent. Don't think um, so. Yeah, maybe you should just go so. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts? The lady. Um, Uh, so I wonder whether people could collaborate um, and help put the knowledge that Dr. Ho and Tom and the rest at Nature Society and you know whoever else in Singapore is knowledgeable about 
um, to put them in the form of, say, you know, a short, catchy clip, um, or a one pager that can be shared via Facebook and so on. Uh, people are pressed for time, right? So not everyone is going to track out to the marshes until they have a sense of what they might see. Uh, so, you know, you could enlarge the group that way, including the, uh, I think the students that you mentioned earlier. Uh, and with that awareness, I think that better grounds our conversation on the kind of um, city that we want, uh, particularly with respect to the environment, and I think that will help uh, the rest of our discussions take off. Uh, I would strongly agree that the security and energy security were uh, sadly and, yeah, grievously. Uh, omitted the white paper, and as we and one thing that was not mentioned either um, at all, I believe, is the risk of a uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic spreading. So if SARS were to happen in Singapore today, given the increase in crowding density, you know, for density, if density has only doubled, um, you know, the growth in transmission is actually exponential. So. You know, the government would say that we, we're not, some of us are not tech, but, you know, can you really say that that's not a severe and very important form of characterization uh, of which there's no time. Um, so, to get back to the key suggestion that I had, um, you know, perhaps those people who are reading with photography and, you know, uh, video clips could come forward to come talk and uh, talk to you, or perhaps you could let your friends know. So you know, let's let's put all our talents together. We may only be able to do one part, um, but I think together we can form a bigger piece of the puzzle of it, you know, how we solve this critical thing. Yeah. So basically, for for people to focus on uh, ways to increase awareness. Sorry. If I'm not mistaken, maybe Hang Chang also, maybe Ria, Ria Tan from our Singapore might know this as well. There is a, a kind of a documentary that was um, posted at Facebook, I don't know the name of the people that were behind it, that had a really short clip um, which relates to what the lady was Singapore talking about. Nature. A very short video of um, the biodiversity, both both on sea and on land. I can't remember what it is and whether it's the kind of thing that you're looking for. Maybe you can explain a little bit, Ria. Yeah. Singapore got me. Me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting it uh, on Facebook. Yeah, it's done by David, um, who's from overseas with uh, uh, Joyce Lynn and um, uh, Sean. Remind me who's the other one? Uh, Eunice. Eunice, is she here today? No. no. Yeah, so they put it together for the Biodiversity Festival last year. Yeah. <coughs> it's, on, it's somewhere on Facebook. Yeah. Singapore got wildlife men. Decide to do them all in yeah. Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> Just something very quick to add. Now, if you like to find out all those 900 different plants, native plants in Singapore, it's quite easy to find. One of the key reasons why not many of us know about the crabs is because it's a catch 22 situation. Most of us eat our crabs in a seafood restaurant. If I'm going to tell these 5.15 million people that there are these rare and dangerous crabs somewhere in Singapore, I'm not sure how long they'll survive. Okay? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that is the, the challenge. Because there are many people out there that are actually taking all these wild animals and plants. Excuse me. Yes. There is a pun in there. Huh? There is I'm a pun the Try to avoid dialogue. Oh. There is a panel. There's a pun. Yes. Yes. 
So it's been <laughs> yeah, so so yes, we would love to have more people aware about the crabs, but we are also concerned that when more people know about it, uh, it might actually endanger it. Yeah, that, that's one of the key reasons. It's not that we don't want to tell more people, but we need to manage the consequences. Thanks, guys. Um, there'll be time for discussions, you know, later. And we'd like to hear from the panel for a little bit more. We have, I think, we have time for about a couple more questions and one comment from senior and Chris. To add on to what has been mentioned about connecting the environment to other issues so that more people will see it as part of the whole rather than part of itself, I would like to suggest that you consider whether you have assumed the environment and the economy to be contradictory. Well, of course, there are many areas where development and environmental concerns are contradictory. A piece of land that has an MRT track that cannot have forest. But there are other areas in which can retrofit the profit motive and other aspects of the economy onto supposed like what we could, what one might call nobler goals of protecting the environment. Why I raise this? Have you heard of a reverse vending machine? No. A reverse vending machine, as the name suggests, is a machine that gives you money when you chuck a bottle into it. To go back to what I said about going to, uh, going to Germany on exchange, I went there with the thinking suspicion that. Germany, although it cycles so much, does not have a significantly higher proportion of hippies compared to the rest of the world. And so why is it that there are so many people who recycle? And I asked my exchange partner's mom and she says because I get like X number of euro cents for each bottle I put in. So if we can broaden this to a spirit of incentivizing what we want to see, then to some extent we will at least make more headway than we are making now. Yeah. That's, that's it for economic. We had a number of questions in the front. Uh, the lady in the front first, and then the gentleman behind her. And Ed Buck. The lady in the front first, and then Buck. Okay, I'm not sure if I can throw my voice. Uh, no, you can hear me, but... Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Malika. Uh, I run a uh, site called Gaia Discovery. And uh, I'm really happy to be here because I think for the first time in a long while, uh, a lot of people are meeting together with uh, more or less the same emotions that we want to play, that we love our land and we want to preserve it, or in fact augment it. Um, I think a, a lot of approaches are being said, and I really like some of the suggestions made. Um, but, um, you know, I think that uh, the government is still the government has a goal that you know we need to increase our population and make some land use, uh, land related changes. They will try to find a way there, and um, I think we need to contribute towards sustainable development um, by mainstreaming environmental issues and war. But I think also uh, perhaps um, this is an opportunity where we can. Um, ask the question, is it time now to have an environmental impact assessment law? Because um, the EIA law uh, is not implemented in Singapore. Singapore has avoided implementing EIA laws for obvious reasons. Uh, our neighboring countries, like Hong Kong, has implemented EIA law. Now, in my opinion, I think EIA law will help Singapore develop sustainably. And I think it will help Singapore um, take into consideration the resources that we have, uh, how much of it we can convert for economic growth, and how much we can uh, preserve for uh, ecological uh, services, and to preserve biodiversity, or in fact, to actually grow our biodiversity. So I have been thinking about how we can actually um, um, coerce or push our government to look into EIA laws. Because EIA laws should, will not actually pose a negative in our economic growth. I think it will contribute to positive in many ways, health services and more. So I would like to hear the panel uh, give some views on what you think about that and how we can actually get there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Malika. Uh, in fact, um, if you for, um, just to recap what I said in my in my speech for the debate, EIA is actually something I unequivocally pushed for, specifically asked for EIA laws to be implemented. I said it's about time. Beyond that, I also said that could I ask also for any kind of preliminary inquiries as a result of their conscious thought being put on this line through the nature reserve as well as the reclamation work, is there any? So the, but the conscious words came out in the speech calling for EIA laws. And you might like to know also, it, um, I've been a member of Nature Society for about more than 25 years now. And in fact, EIA laws have been something we've been pushing for many, 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 many years. Um, maybe not pushing hard enough to the level that we would like it to. Like you said, Malika, it's about time. Um, internally, when I speak to certain ministers about this issue, you probably know this already, the fear that if we have EIA laws, quote unquote, what about my sand? How am I going to develop, quote unquote? So, their fear is that if we have this, are we going to be like the other countries where because of public pressure, we cannot do what we plan to do in the time that we want to do them. In other words, it will halt development. But like Malika rightly pointed out, it is incumbent on us as people who are pushing for this, and we are very mindful of that. There are some lawyers involved, uh, together with me, I have a law background, to actually push for this, uh, to sort of say to them um, that it's not a zero-sum game. It's not as if it's all for us and nothing for you. It works out for you too because what it means is that you will be beyond, you will be above reproach if anything bad happens because you, the public will know you've done your research, you've done your assessment and this is what you've decided. It's open and clear. The other thing we want to ask for is that these laws to be made transparent. No good having them when we can't have a look at them. For right now we can't. Right now, they will tell you what you can and cannot look at. That has been our experience with Bukit Brown. So that's, a, that's these are the things that that we would like to see happen. Will it happen in my term as NMP? I would like. To, that's my wish list. We will we'll do our best. But for those of you who do know this issue, please work with us. Um, if you have any kind of professional expertise in this area, I would highly, highly welcome your experience, your expertise, your input. Get in touch with me. We would really welcome such views. Thank you. I think uh, having a mandatory EIA law is very important. So, why uh, so I just push it in parliament? Okay, so uh, of course, right now, uh, EIA is something that is at the discretion of URA. So, if they're going to develop any area, and uh, they usually ask to check with the end parks to see whether the area is important biodiversity. If they feel it's important, but they will definitely uh, push the uh, developer to do the EIA, or hang, to spend money on the EIA to get the uh, stage, to get their, their consultant. They have the right to choose a consultant to do the EIA. So uh, when the EIA is finished, uh, if you, it is not automatically, of course, uh, released to the public, right? Uh, but the thing is that. Uh, if we want, like Nature Society, if we want to have a look at it, uh, they will allow us to have a look at it, all right? But you know, the strange thing is, the conclusion of the EIA is really without us, right? So we don't know. The data are there. The, what are the species, plants, birds, and blah, blah, blah. All this given to you. But the concluding, the conclusion, the decision of the consultant, is something that is without. Right? In the case of Bukit Brown, this happened. I mean, we are not allowed to look at the conclusion. Uh, in other case, uh, uh, down in the, uh, the uh, Mandai Lake Road development, uh, tourist promotion development, same thing. Same thing. And so it should be something that is open, maybe to be put on exhibition so that the public can have a look at. Uh, post questions and all that. But ultimately, of course, the decision will lie with the government as well, with the authority, whether to proceed with the development or not. But of course, if the consultant uh, put a strong case, a strong voice for the preservation of some of the area or part of the area or the whole area, 
then of course there's a lot of pressure uh, on the government. I think my like I only found out about the EIA law issue like this year, and while I cannot say that I know very much about it, I guess I would just like to share what my response was. I, I didn't really articulate it because I, I couldn't really find the right words, but it kind of was like I felt like the EIA being partially shown to people who wanted to see it is an illusion of knowledge. It's an illusion because you cannot, like what Dr. Ho said, you cannot see the conclusion. And you can only see the part that you want you to see. And you do not possess the knowledge. You cannot have it in a common space where you can assess it anytime like the population might prefer. And that is an illusion of knowledge and not knowledge of the environmental impact. And to, to, to say anything meaningful, we need to have the actual knowledge. That's what I feel. Uh. And so I will obviously support having the EIA law. But that brings me to my second point about how I think there's also a disconnection, which is to say that among many of us sitting here, we'll probably see why we want to have an EIA law. Because the benefits are very tangible to us, because we love the places that would otherwise be destroyed, and because we value biodiversity. But to some people sitting in offices who never really had a chance or time to go and feel the biodiversity, it might not mean very much to them. And it might just be a list of 900 species. And so when the benefits for the government are not very tangible, I don't think they will want to do it. And this actually like is kind of a parallel with another situation, which is the VCA Green Mark, um, which is, in case you have not heard of it, is a legislation to make sure that buildings conform to certain energy usage and efficiency codes. But the government is currently pushing for it because um, it creates green jobs especially in the technical skills which Singapore is pretty good at maturing. In a similar way, if the benefits of EIA law can be expressed as economically and therefore as familiarly to the government as that of the green mark has been. Sorry, I know that was a bit convoluted, but basically if they can see it in a similar light, then I think that they might be more willing to adopt the EIA law. I think the EIA law here, uh, a tricky part is that uh, what, are the, what is the scope of this EIA right, in the context of Singapore? Uh, do we just include the biodiversity component, the, what they call things that can be quantified, soil, uh, hydrology, or things like that? Uh, when it comes to, you want to take a kind of holistic stance with conservation of nature, then you are going to talk about basically the emotional, psychological component values of nature. You see. The problem now, of course, is that uh, the problem of how to quantify such values. So, uh, in the current context, uh, I don't know. I mean, in terms of uh, recreational value, you know, maybe ecological economics, we have some way. Yeah, but uh, when it comes to emotional, psychological, spiritual component of those, I, they may be a lot of those. And the government is just say, leave that out. Just go for things that we can definitely find. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Thanks for your comments, Ray. Um, we're coming to the close of this session, but you can always approach the panelists to have a chat afterwards. Uh, but final now, uh, my name is W2, I'm from uh, Kampung West Coast, Singapore. Now, uh, let, 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 me, let, me, let me share my concerns. Do you want to stand up? Do you want to stand up? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is W2 and from Kampong West Coast, Singapore. Uh, let me share with the uh, panel my concerns about the future. Now, uh, every one of us, especially the younger generation, are extremely mobile. We travel all, all over the world. And uh, when that target year approaches, the sovereign boundaries of Singapore will actually change. The 
concept of the sovereign state is made in Now, <coughs> with respect to the environment, now I'm very concerned about the excessive use of mechanical air conditioning. Uh, the focus in the discussion all along has been about you know, little crabs, fresh water crabs, and other biological creatures. Fine, but there's a bit of a paradox here in the sense that if too many humans go to these places, this species will be disturbed. The bigger concern now is how can we grow without excessively creating more heat? Because as it is now, most buildings are heat traps. Everybody is so addicted to air conditioning. We are subconsciously killing ourselves with all this secondary mechanical heating. So as a member of parliament, I really do hope that you push this from the other angle rather than you know plants, trees, flora, fauna. We, we, there are so many angles that you can 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 can, can approach and attack this government so to speak. But we cannot hide the fact that we are part of that literal community of Southeast Asia. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. I think, in fact, uh, that will come. It wasn't, I suppose, you know, there's so many things you can pick up, you know, and, and, and within that 15 minute speech limit that I had in the debate, it's not possible to be very specific. That one, I, I consider that as coming under my query about how why is there no information or no um, any sort of research in the white paper related to carbon footprint, which is a little bit of what you said, I guess, but not specifically. Um, in fact, actually, if you think about it, there are other members of parliament who raise quite a fair bit about what I would call that kind of clean technology. Um, even even some of the opposition people are also talking about the environment. So that, that I think, has been raised. Uh, and perhaps the, 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 the policies are there already. The question, of course, is the more people, the more the more needs. I mean, we go back to square one, right? Why, the, why do we need more people? And really, you cannot, I suppose, um, take that issue separately from the so-called green issue because why are we becoming hotter? Because there are no more forests. So that is, it's all very interconnected, isn't it? So we can't, we can't kind of take it out of its context. Although I do agree with Wayne that perhaps there can be greater push, there must be greater push for more clean technology, more less use of aircon and so on. Thank you. Think one thing that we can uh, demand is that uh, given that uh, ultimately the vision that Singapore should only have 10% of uh, greenery uh, intact, 5.5% for far, 4.5% for nature reserve, we can demand an EIA, a very broad comprehensive EIA to assess the cost benefit of uh, the situation when we have only 10% of greenery left do an EIA for that, all right? All right. In terms of, let's say, uh, money spent on uh, using more aircon to keep cool those plants, keep the ambient temperature down, things like that, uh, carbon sequestration, the loss of this ability to sequester carbon, uh, flooding problem, translate those into all into dollar and say quantify it, loss of a uh, green what they call recreational arenas, areas for you know, recreation, quantify that okay? and uh, compare this with the benefits we'll derive from you know economic growth and see what will be lost, who knows, I think that needs to be done. Bye. Okay, um, just to end, like, since we have no more time, I'd just like to say very shortly that uh, I think like for all of us, maybe the most important thing now is not really, like it's less so what is happening in society and more so who are we in relation to that. Because I realized that like what I know about the environment is actually not very different from a lot of my friends. 
but it's for how we deal with what we know about the environment. And I think, um, as you probably can tell, there's like an infinite amount of things that you can know about the environment, so you'll never end up knowing everything. So if you can feel that you are somewhat of worth, and you therefore can you do something about it, and start thinking about how, then it will all make a lot more sense than a whole onslaught of numbers about how many species there are in what place. So much. So thank you very much uh, to Grace for moderating the discussion and uh, to the wonderful panelists. Can we all give another round of applause? For them? Does anybody have a very, very quick announcement to make? Chris, did you have one? Under a minute? Yes. Okay, bro. Hi, everyone. I'll keep it short. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from Ground Up Initiative. I'm actually from the education arm of Ground Up Initiative, Wow Kampong. We nurture people that are sustainable, uh, grounded, and find a sense of purpose with joy in their lives. Um, we work with corporations, institutions, and schools to do that, to nurture character, and we currently have an opening for a salesperson. So if you would like to get involved in environmental issues and make an impact on students in training people, in teaching people about these things, and if you can close, then come and talk to me, and I'd, I'd love to meet you and tell you more about what we do and see if it's something you'd like to be part of. Thank you, a brief job then, Han Chong. Good evening once again. Um, there is this open letter to say Bukit Browns. For those of you who have not signed the petition, you can do so. I'm just uh, promoting this again because I feel that this is connected to today's issue about land use. And also we are losing a big part of our cultural heritage. Um, and heritage really should be part of the equation here. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to remind you, we have a Facebook uh, group, uh, and it's called Green Drink Singapore, so if you haven't joined it, please uh, uh, please make sure you like the page. Uh, sorry, it's a group, so please join the group. And also, do you have an announcement? Okay. Can I say that I said it at the last uh, meeting, but I think it's a different crowd here tonight. Uh, I just want to talk about uh, the missing uh, environmentalist in Laos by the name of Sombat Songkorn. Uh, he has a website, can you, you can just Google him. It's a very simple website, www.sombat.org. Uh, and uh, any support that all of you can give, there is an ABAS petition uh, you can sign. And uh, there are some things that they have suggested that you can do to support, whether to write letters to the ministers of the ASEAN. So, Please support in any way, he's an environmentalist. His life was dedicated to sustainable development and he has been illegally abducted, uh, missing since before Christmas. His whole story is in the website, so I don't want to waste the time. Yeah, and we'll also post it on our Green Drinks website so that uh, everybody can join. So in case you don't know, we have a Green Drinks website, so you can uh, and a LinkedIn group as well, so you know whichever you're comfortable with. Um, we will be conducting a survey, so watch out for that. We appreciate your participation. We will make the announcement on Facebook, so please, please do give your feedback on how you, uh, you know, the kind of themes that you would like to see on future green drinks and uh, what we can do better. So uh, please watch out for that and participate. Thank you very much. We're going to have a band. Just one more now. We're going to have a band uh, at 9 p.m. So do hang around um, and uh, listen to the band. Please feel free to stay behind and ask the panelists further questions and also network. See you again next month.